This game, played right at the top in the World Under-20 Championship, features a remarkable position, a kind of position that I don't think I've seen before in a, in a proper game in chess. So this is Marc Andrea Maurizzi from France against Ivan Shitko from Moldova. This was played in round nine of the World Under-20 Championship. So going into this, Maurizzi was actually one of the leaders. So let's see what happened. Um, it's a Spanish. All normal so far until black plays bishop c5. Well, there are a few variations where the bishop ends up on c5 in the Spanish, but these are quite double-edged. And it's quite a risky move. It's an ambitious move because, of course, the bishop stands well on this diagonal, looking at the good old f2 square. But it does provoke white into playing with c3 and d4. So white can gain time against that bishop. And knight e7. So this is certainly an unusual variation. Normally one would expect b5 and then knight f6. Uh, but it's unusual for this knight to end up on e7. But there have been a few quite decent players that have tried this, this sideline recently, including Lei from Vietnam and uh, yeah, a few others as well. Um, d4, hitting that bishop. So this is the problem that white manages to, to get in this this big centre. But that bishop is lurking in the wings. You never know when it might uh, have its moment. So black can get away with this because these knights are protecting that pawn on e5. This move seems very logical to play bishop g5, which really induces black into playing the pawn to f6. Not a beautiful move, but black can get away with this. We'll, we'll see why in a second. Castles is the most popular move here. d6. So it's sort of... Well, it, it looks solid. At least, you know, the, the pawn on e5 is well protected. And this diagonal is open, but black anyway intends castling and pushing forward with f5. So that, that pawn's going to move. So it's not so silly, you know, this this is quite a strong point on e5. Maurizzi decides to push. So this is very forcing. Obviously there's a pin here, and black is going to have to relieve that pin by playing b5. So it sets in uh sets in train some some complications. You could go b5 immediately here, but um, black decides to exchange on e3 first. Pawn takes knight. Now, because of the threat here, then obviously that's a discovered check, so black has to play b5. And white captures here, and black takes on a4. So after that little flurry of tactics, we've had some exchanges, and actually white is a pawn up. But white has a very strange pawn structure with these doubled isolated pawns and this extra pawn on c6 is you know quite detached from the rest of white's army castles okay have a think how would you play here with white i think this next move is very important white to play okay here's your first moment for a little think. White play. I suppose an automatic move would be knight d2 or knight, knight a3. But it's much better to play c4 because that knight needs to land on that beautiful square d5, the outpost. It needs to have this option in order to make black, white's position playable. So, for example, if black attempts to pick up this pawn like this with knight e7, then knight d5 is very powerful indeed. Looking at the c7 pawn, um, also looking at that e7 square. So, really important move, c4. 
black needs counterplay. If white develops, puts the knight here, puts rook in rook in the middle somewhere, then it just looks great for white and an extra pawn. So black needs to shake things up and get counterplay on the king side. And this is very logical, considering that white's queen is somewhat offside, at least from the king side. Knight c3, the knight develops. Pawn takes pawn. Now, excellent move from white here. If knight takes pawn, then bishop f5, yeah, black has some counterplay. Knight d2, really good move. It's important that that knight still has the option to come into d5, so this knight drops back in order to take on e4. Bishop f5. In fact, I mean, white now plays knight d takes e4. Another interesting option, considering that this pawn simply blocks the bishop, an, an interesting option is just to play rook f2 and double on the f-file and leave this one here for the moment. But knight takes e4 is absolutely fine. Queen h4, but black does have counterplay here. Threats to take on e4, so that's why white plays c5. No doubt that was uh, premeditated. The queen cuts across to defend the knight. d5. Right, things are really hotting up. Of course, if knight takes pawn, then this knight is hanging. So, what did white play now? There's there's a couple of tempting options. Uh, certainly, there's, there's one option that would be in in my eye here for white i would certainly look at rook takes bishop and then taking on d5 because that leaves these knights beautifully placed in the middle of the board for for the exchange looks like pretty good compensation the only thing is rook f2 actually gives black excellent compensation uh well, i don't know about compensation but excellent counterplay um Knight takes impossible, there's a pin here, and black can follow up with the second rook, and certainly black has very good counterplay on the king side. So what else? Well, you don't really want to retreat that knight, because after the exchange, the bishop comes back. These knights just don't look very good in this position. They haven't found decent squares it's quite possible that that pawn is going to be picked up um, and those centre pawns look very pleasant for black. So, no, that doesn't look right. So what did white play here? Fantastic move. Knight d6. Just leaping in there. Brilliant move. If that's taken, then ex an exchange of queens and these pawns are really powerful and knight takes pawn coming as well. These pieces are very awkwardly placed. In fact, white is doing extremely well there. But what should black play? Well, black exchange queens, and again, one has to ask, well, what happens if pawn takes knight? Black didn't do this. It's possible to take here, but in fact it's even better to play knight b6. And the, the threat to this rook and taking here is actually just too much for black. I mean, it, you know, where where can that uh, rook move to? If it moves here, then c7 is really powerful. And don't forget this kind of thing can happen. And queen. So bishop d3, now that's a very tempting move. In fact, I mean, my computer tells me that bishop e6 is still playable for black, but bishop d3, very tempting. Trying to get some control over that f-file. You know, if white were to exchange here, then actually it's not quite clear what, what white is doing in that position, and f1 is controlled. Black is certainly in the game. So what should white play here? Okay, time for you to have another think. Time for me to have a quick slurp of tea. White play. Well, I did mention that we're going to see a truly remarkable position. I don't think I've seen anything quite like this before. 
white played knight b6. So just look at those knights. I hesitate to call them octopus knights. I suppose they are, but they're pretty weird octopus knights when actually black can capture both knights. Well, not, not both of them <laughs> can capture either knight. <laughs> An extraordinary position. And knight b6 is a fantastically strong move. So let's just go through. Well, why not? Why not this one? Well, white will exchange rooks and take here. And those pawns are just too strong. And yeah, if this one. Yeah, again, I think. Well, I think there are several options here, but one could simply take here. And it must be winning. Um, so, well, what else? Um, rook takes here. Rook here. This is just good for white. This is a key move. Knight takes pawn. Yeah, we can see that knight not only hits the rook, but it hits, hits that d5 pawn as well. So what should black do? Well, black took the rook and... Rook takes, uh, excuse me, knight takes rook. It's quite an extraordinary position. Uh, but after these exchanges, it looks a bit more normal, although this knight is still hanging on d6. Still not good to take that. Black is a piece up. Um, and these pawns don't go through straight away, but rook f5 is a really powerful move. Um, just wanting to scoop those pawns, and then the pawns can be pushed after that. So that's the position. Uh, black played rook d8. Now another very interesting moment in the game where it's not completely clear how white should continue. Uh, white found a, a very cool move. I mean, I suppose it's possible to play knight b7, and the knight is secure there. But white holds his nerve. Maurizzi holds his nerve here and plays b4. The idea is actually very simple, that pass pawn should be pushed. And if black is doing nothing, then white is just going to play a4, b5, and get that pawn mass rolling down the board. So it's a remarkable move. Yeah, if, if the knight is taken, then white is just pushing those pawns. So knight e7, okay, that's a very understandable move. You want to take that pawn. But now rook f7, everything hangs together because that knight remains on d6. So the rook is able to enter and obviously gaining time against the knight on e7 knight c6 and rook c7 well finally that knight is actually secure and I think now I can safely call it an octopus knight because it's securely protected on d6 and covers so many key squares um, and, and as is so often the case with an octopus knight it shuts out the, the enemy rook So, what did black do? Well, these pawns are just too strong. Knight takes pawn, that has to be played to eliminate one of the pawns, but this looks too powerful. Rook b7, good move. You want to get ready to push that pawn. So, a5. And here, white doesn't play in the best way. Um, knight f5 looks really powerful. To, to break in on the seventh rank. In fact, this is, could have been played the move before instead of rook b7 in this position. Knight f5, also very, very strong. Um, and if g6, then check, and then rook b7. And you can see that that knight has switched position, but controls the queening square and c6. And that is going to be winning for white. So yeah, 
knight f5 on either of the last two moves would have been strong. But a3 played. And this gives black a chance. I mean, I have no doubt that there was time pressure involved here. We're on move 28. Um, so, yeah, I can imagine time, some time pressure involved. Um, black played knight d3 here, but actually knight a6 gives black a really good chance. That pawn can't really be pushed because the knight covers the c7 square and obviously you know black black is fine um so knight a6 was a strong move and then white can play knight f5 but will will white win this position it's it's a tough one um of course with control over the seventh that looks pretty good but there's potential to push that pawn Let's go back here. Um, knight d3 played instead. But this is very strong now. c6. Of course, if that's taken, then the pawn is going to go through. So knight c5. And there are quite a few ways to win here. Rook b6 is very neat. If that's taken, then c7 and that pawn can't be stopped. Knight e6. Knight b5, so this just covers c7. And c7 anyway, threatening the knight, but also rook b8. Knight takes, so this just wins material. And this is very, very easy to clear up. And round about here, black resigned. Uh, just a fascinating game. I think uh, Maurizzi played really bravely, uh, going right back to this position and playing c5 followed by knight d6. That was the start of all the fun, and it's incredible that that knight lasted on the d6 square for so long. And then to find this idea... I think is fantastic. You know, there were safer continuations, but knight b6 is not only a very elegant move, very visual move, but it's actually incredibly powerful. There we go. So, quick, very quick look at the standings after nine rounds. Two rounds still to play. Maurizzi is in the sole lead with seven and a half, and then there are four players on seven. There were some really interesting games in that ninth round. Um... And there's a pack of players on six and a half, including Hans Niemann, who, who drew his game. Uh, that was actually another really interesting game. So Maurizzi leading with seven and a half with quite a chasing pack with two rounds to go. Thanks for watching.